You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. With me, as always, Eric Johnson. Hi, Eric. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and uh, I'm particularly excited for uh, for our episode this week because this is a question that well, we've been asked like for years. Um, people are always curious in behavioral science about this, but sort of the balance of behavioral science and neuroscience, and how are they similar, and how are they different. Um, and you know when to use what tools and all that good stuff. And so we have an excellent guest with us to discuss this, Michelle Nigella. And she is the scientific director and the vice president of innovation at HCD Research. And um, she's written some excellent articles on this as well. So we'll um, try to link to some of that stuff too. Um, but Michelle, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. So maybe we can start by, um, you know, we usually, we, we often ask folks kind of like their um, their backstory a little bit of like how they kind of got into the field. So I know that you have, you know, a background in psychology and you worked in industry for a while and you've done a lot of research. So maybe kind of, you know, walk our listeners through sort of the path that you t- took to get into um, kind of the neuroscience that, that you do now. Sure. Yeah. It's been a, a long journey, as they say. So I I started off in academia getting my PhD in behavioral neuroscience, in particular um, behavioral neurogenetics, looking at the influences of food intake and behavior, feeding behavior. Um, Then went on to do my postdoc at Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia, where I focused on sensory, like taste and smell type of uh, research questions. And Monell's pretty cool because it actually uh, does a lot of work with industry. So food companies and beverage companies and flavor and fragrance creators. And that uh, kind of introduced me to the whole idea of industry doing research because in academia, they they don't really teach that. Everything is, you know, meant for writing papers and doing research grants and, and you know, discovering the next big thing. Um, but industry was always seen as being a little bit evil, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I ended up finding, you know, I'd been working on rodent models and Um, I ended up being really allergic to rodents Um, over, you know, 10, 15 years of research. I ended up developing allergies and had to look at changing careers uh, and just started looking into industry uh, by the guidance of my advisor. And and he said, you know, you have an outgoing personality. I think you, you know, do well in industry. And so I applied for my first job, which was at Johnson and Johnson. And they were actually looking for someone who had a psychology and neuroscience background in sensory. And so it was kind of perfect for me, right? Uh, And it was to lead, be the scientific lead for flavor and fragrance innovation research, um, you know, for adding new flavors and fragrances to consumer products. Uh, So that was my first venture into really new methodologies of neuroscience and psychology and consumer research. Um, And so that was, that was the first. And then I moved on to work at Mars Chocolate um, to be global sensory. And uh, I happened to come across HCD research that they were using neuroscience to study market research. And uh, I went to the owner, Glenn, and said, I know you do mainly communications and media research, but have you heard about consumer research with products, with sensory? And, and he hadn't. And so he took a chance and brought me in. And now here I am doing uh, some really fun stuff. Uh, piggyback on a little bit of the background and maybe start getting into some definitions a little bit because- sure. um, you know, like I mentioned, neuroscience is definitely a topic that comes up a lot and people are interested mm. in it. But I think um, for those of us that are in, you know, different fields of psychology, we might have a accurate or inaccurate definition of what exactly that yeah. means. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering if you could maybe define a little bit of like, you know, even just like getting more specific, what is neuroscience and then the specific fields you studied and worked in. And then um, maybe we can then move into talking about what exactly yes. like neuroscience research looks like. That's perfect because um, I think there is a lot of misconceptions, right? So I think when people think of neuroscience, they think immediately think of brain and reading people's minds and and things like that. But neuroscience is really broad, right? It's like, um, it's really integration of a lot of sciences. So anything from, you know, physics to pharmacology to cellular biology, psychology, and it, it really stemmed from, you know, psychology and psychophysics. So, you know, how does your body 
do what it does, basically. Like, how do you move your arms? How do you think? How do you breathe? All those things are controlled by your brain. And so that's neuroscience and it can be any of those things. There are people who only do bench works in, in you know, dishes. Uh, and then there are people that work with humans, right? So it's a pretty broad topic uh, and it can be any, anything um, really that involves any sort of research like that. When it comes to taking that really you know, integrative um, field of, of neuroscience, then you try to apply it to, to consumer and market research that's where it gets tricky, right? Because people are taking this science and that's very you know, esoteric and looking at anatomic and cellular and signal processing, and then saying that that actually you can leap over and say it says something about how consumers interact with products or communications. And that's a huge leap, like to say that something that's happening in a dish or something that's happened in a lab in a, a large university, right? Where they're using fMRI to look at specific areas of the brain, that that somehow, you know, leaps over to how you make your decisions at a shelf, um, which is a huge leap. And kind of the way I like to really think about describing that is like how complicated that really is and what a large leap that really is, is that, so your brain is really complicated, right? So you have 100 billion neurons in this three pound structure, four pound structure. And that's 100 billion neurons with 100 trillion connections between them, 3 million miles of axons that are all like clumped together in your brain. All of those sorts of things are just in your human brain. And to think that you can really make, oversimplify that into you know being able to understand it, um, well, the brain is a lot more complicated than I think people realize. And so, you know, it does take all these different disciplines to really understand what's going on in the brain. When I'm talking about the complexity of the human brain, it's really that, you know, a lot of the academic work is um, often looking at, say, like a sea slug in a dish, right? Because that's something that you can actually see the neurons acting. Um, but when you take it all the way to this human brain that has 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion connections, um, it, you can't look at things as, as simply as looking at the activity of one neuron and make any predictions about human behavior like you could in the sea slug. So that's important to sort of realize about neuroscience that humans are super complicated. And if it was something that you could just predict people's behavior so easily or that you could read their minds, well, we'd have to be as simple as a sea slug, right? Yeah, that's, it's interesting that you bring that up because um, I think that's also, you know, for those that are more in the behavioral science outside of neuroscience, it's almost a, a similar question that comes up a lot and that um, people think you can predict and understand why people are doing a lot more. And it's, you know, it, it to me, it logically, it makes a little more sense. People might get confused that with neuroscience because it's a lot more technical and we're talking about the like inner workings of the brain. And you're like, oh, if you understand all these neurons and things like that, then of course you can understand how why are people would do things or something like that. But it's interesting how that kind of goes across whenever you talk about these kind of things uh, that people tend to like almost give us too much more credit yeah. than we deserve for how much we can actually, you know, motivate or change what people do. It's still really, really hard regardless of all this. Instrument. Oh, absolutely. Because sometimes like, you know, to what you're saying, like people think about neuroscience as like all these things going on in the brain. And we have these really cool tools to be able to me you know, measure what's going on in the brain, whether it's fMRI where you're taking pretty pictures, right? Or EEG where you're looking at electrical activity. People automatically assume then that because you have this fabulous technology that you have these amazing abilities, right, to understand what's going on. But humans are super complicated. And when, you know, again, thinking of that esoteric knowledge from academia, you know, that's really that when you try to take something that's as controlled as it is in an academic setting, like in a lab setting, where you're doing fMRI or EEG or someone on someone in a lab setting, and then you take that into someone in a store, well, there's a lot going on there in that store, a lot of noise. Um, and it's not as simple as just slapping some gear on someone's head and being able to read their mind. Like there's just a lot more going into it than that. And sometimes we just trust people because they, they say they're using fancy equipment, right? Or they say they, they are a neuroscientist. I often joke that, you know, having a PhD doesn't mean you know everything. It just means you're a knowledge ninja. You can go off and you can find information, right? But I don't know everything there is to know about the brain. And I think that's something that you learn in grad school is how little you know, right? And yeah, so be yeah. able to appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of similar in a lot of ways to, I know we're in a very like data driven world, for example, and like the more that I, you know, I've never done a PhD, but the more I've learned about 
working with data, doing statistics, running experiments, the more I realize it generally just tells you more of what you don't know and not what you do know. <laughs> but it's kind of the opposite. People sort of expect you to give these answers You say, hey, here's a model I gave that it's predicting something or trying to project something that might happen. And people just naturally take that as like a certainty because they're like, look at all yeah. these fancy numbers and graphs that you're giving. Like, what do you mean you don't know? And it's like, it's very like kind of non-intuitive that the more you understand about it, the more you just kind of find more questions to ask than answers really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause you know, people love those pretty pictures and the fancy equipment, <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean you've actually gained any further knowledge necessarily. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like an easy way to understand things too. You know, I think people are always looking for like kind of a simple, like this, a simpler explanation. So when you have a finding or something like that, that seems like it's analogous enough, people are, I think, tempted to kind of grab onto it. I'm, I'm curious how, because you mentioned that this is, you know, the intersection of any number of fields. And so I'm, I'm curious how, like, specifically psychology shows up in the, the research that you're doing. In the research that I'm doing, I mean, psychology is really the foundation of neuroscience, I kind of feel, because like that's where a lot of the great neuroscientific researchers really came from with psychophysics, where they just wanted to know like how you did what you did and whether it was, you know, in the early stages of someone just being able to see like, okay, if I put two pins on my skin and get them closer and closer and closer, like how close to it are they before I can sense that there's not two anymore that you think there's just one, right? So just psych psychophysics in the, in the sense of measuring reactions, right? But when psychology comes into research I'm doing, I think it's part of all of it. I mean, thinking about uh, what we learned in, in study design, right? What's the proper way to make sure that you've designed your study correctly to answer the questions that you're looking for? Because the research question is arguably the most important part of any of the research that we do. Because each of the tools that are out there you know, they, they answer different things. And so you got to start with the research question first. And sometimes it's not about a fancy tool like doing EEG or fMRI. Sometimes it is just a psychological tool. Sometimes it's, you know, a, a validated survey for looking at anxiety levels. Um, or sometimes it's using implicit association testing to look at perceptual qualities, right? So those things don't have to necessarily be, you know, a fancy physiological neuroscience study. Uh, it can be something that is, is more psychology based. And when you're talking about human behavior, you're really talking about psychology, right? I mean, um, neuroscience is looking at the mechanisms behind that, but the ultimate theoretical framework there is psychology for sure. So I guess I'm curious as to like when, when you, how you would decide what tools to use when, you know, like the sort of, because mm -hmm. I think you're right that a lot of people kind of picture this sort of like fancy hook somebody up to a machine and like, oh, let's part their brain lights up, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, so, you know, when are times when you, when you like would want to use that or like a tool, like so, mm -hmm. something similar to that versus kind of, you know, like a, a survey or some other kind of more traditional method? Yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the first thing we always go for is the research question. I mean, we certainly have clients that come to us and say, can you slap some gear on someone's head? And yeah, we can, but <laughs> that's not where I like to start. Yeah, you know, it's like, uh, you know, let, let's start with what you want to know, right? And sometimes the answer is, no, you don't have to slap any gear on someone's head, just do the survey. Uh, because if you're, you know, the important point I want to make here is really that, neuroscience and psychology aren't a replacement for the surveys, you still need to ask people, right? Because if, if, for example, I wanted to ask you about liking, like, do you like this product? You can tell me. And no matter what measure I choose, be it the fanciest of the fanciest of FNIRS or fMRI or EEG or implicit association or facial coding, whatever it might be, they are terrible at assessing liking. Like people are much more accurate, much more reliable, when you just ask them, okay, zero to seven, how much do you like it? They're, they're a lot better in that. And it's a lot cheaper too. So being able to be honest and say like, yeah, you don't, you don't need to do fMRI. You can just ask the person is important to recognize. But the important thing there is that you use the right tool for the right question, right? So you use the survey to ask liking. You use maybe the neuroscience or psychology to understand why they like it. Right. So, OK, they say they give it a five out of seven on liking, but maybe that's related to the fact that they have an increase in heart rate or maybe there is increased activity in a certain area of the brain that, you know, is is part of that experience that's making them like it better. Like that's important to know. Um, but replacing the question of liking isn't something that we do. You talked a little bit about like sort of the general process and methods and some of the different tools you use, but 
I think a lot of people might be more familiar with behavioral design projects and things like that. But, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, there's probably similarities, but also some differences. So like, yeah. you know, walks through a little bit, like how do you determine what a question is? And then how do you determine which of the fancy tools versus non-fancy tools to use <laughs> um, and measure things and uh, stuff like that? Sure. Yeah. So first, you know, when talking to a client, discovering like, well, what is your research question? Often they have a specific situation, right? So maybe they're trying to show that a product is in fact making someone feel more um, relaxed, right? So then the question is, well, which is the best tool to apply to that? You know, if the question is just something physiological like that, then you might just want to use um, a pretty straightforward physiological tool. But usually it's not as simple as that. You want to show that, yes, it's relaxing, but in addition, you know, the person likes the product, it fits well with the product, it matches the brand. So there's a couple of different components that go into it. It's never strictly a physiological measure that we're doing. Typically, we come and we do a portion that is physiological. We're going to measure that the person is physiologically relaxed. Uh, we're going to ask them if they actually feel relaxed as well, because it's important to get that cognitive component um, that they actually can state that they feel relaxed. Um, we want to make sure that they like it, maybe look perceptually. Is there a match with uh, like brand harmony, as we might call it, that you actually, when you look at this brand, you expect to be relaxed because if those things don't match, it actually affects your liking of a product. So overall, you know, we usually have multiple pieces of a research study that involve like some sort of neuroscience or psychology piece, but also some sort of quantitative or qualitative research piece so that we can then integrate those ideas together to be able to better understand, you know, in our case, wanting to know how the consumer is experiencing the product or the media or whatever it might be. And we might bring people in to a location to be able to measure. You know, there are some measures you can actually do online. So, you know, when, whenever we answer a question like that, it's very much, it depends. So it's just always like our favorite answer, right? Yeah, for sure. It depends. <laughs> it can depend on the population you're measuring. Um, you know, you do have to think about that. For example, if you're looking at skin conductance, well, that's a measure that's, you know, on the palm of the hand. So you have to might maybe think about time of year where hands are drier or with older populations that have drier skin. Sometimes they don't, they're considered non-responders. So you might have to think about the population you're using to choose the right tool. Um, you have to think about the research question that the tool is actually going to give you a useful answer for that. We have to establish action standards so that any of the results that we get are going to be meaningful and that the, the client can actually use those to make a business decision. You know, instead of just having like, oh, that's interesting, you know, we don't have a situation where the client gets the, the results and says, that's interesting, but what do I do with that now? We want to make sure that they can actually make a real business decision and an actionable result from it. So a lot of it, uh, the design and the, the carrying out the project has to do around your know, research question and uh, actionable results. Yeah, I'm sure that there's like a spectrum here, but how savvy would you say that clients are with this stuff? I mean, I know that you said that you were sort of surprised when you found like, oh, there's this whole world of research that's happening in industry and that in such alignment with your uh, mm -hmm. academic studies. Do you, do you find that clients are, they sort of see like they kind of understand the value and they understand the, the methodology and the, pro the process and the tools right. and they're coming to you to sort of like execute it or are they sort of like hey I heard about this and I don't really know exactly how it works but it seems cool and that's why they're kind of like hook somebody up to a you know to a machine and then like tell me what they're thinking. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Yeah. We get definitely, you know, a spectrum of that. We get people that have heard of neuroscience. Sometimes it's like the, the higher ups executive team, you know, at a large company that they heard of neuroscience at a conference and they go down to their, their researchers and say, you have to do neuroscience. They don't specify necessarily what that means, but the new initiative is that we're, we're going to do neuro or system one or whatever it is people want to call it. Right. And so, um, you know, what ends up happening there is that you have someone that comes in and says, you know, can you slap some gear on someone's head? But I think that that was kind of like more in the early stages. I think now that people are getting a little more familiar with the ideas um, and they've seen some results, whether they're positive or negative, people started asking questions. So I think a big mistake that a lot of um, sort of neuroscience research providers in industry have made is that they're underestimating their clients. Clients are starting to ask questions about actionable results, um, making sure that there's validity in the measures. And so I think you really have to appreciate what what clients know but also recognizing that i may know neuroscience and psychology 
but I'm not an expert at their product, right? So often I try to be as collaborative as possible with the client because let's say you're doing dish soap, right? I don't know everything about dish soap, but they've been working with dish soap for however many years. I have to make sure to really incorporate them on how they typically do their research with dish soap. Um, you know, what are the sort of insights that they've gotten and what are they missing to make sure that that's, that's really aligned, right? Because I, again, I have to appreciate that I don't know and appreciate their knowledge. So it, it's definitely a bit of a back and forth like that, but also recognizing that my first job was to be the technical lead at, you know, a client on the client side. And a lot of that job was vetting out the research providers like I am now, right? So making sure that when someone came to me and said, I have this widget and it measures brain activity, it was kind of my job to say, uh, no, it doesn't, right? <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's a, it's a really important thing there to recognize that there's a great possibility these days that the end client has someone on staff that has a PhD in neuroscience or psychology and may call you out if you, you know, say something that's not true. Uh, and so, you know, this whole thing where a lot, you know, in the early stages of neuromarketing, you know, as it was once called, was to sort of like pull the, you know, the, the veil over people with fancy words like brain imaging or, you know, usually you know, pretty pictures of the brain and things like that to sort of cloud over what they didn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. But now, since a lot of clients have some expertise or, you know, are asking even academic people to review proposals, um, I think people have to appreciate that that clients may know more than they're letting on. And so you, as a provider, you have to be really honest, I think, and make sure that the tools you're using are really validated because there is a lot of bad science out there for sure. Yeah. I mean, you see even more and more like consumer neuro products like i'll get right. random like instagram ads or whatever for like oh like strap this on and it'll help you you know like solve some problem in your life you know and yeah. <laughs> so so maybe if um maybe folks might benefit actually from from kind of some insight that you might have on the the kind of charlatans out there or things that that you yeah. might Maybe not sure. That might be kind of a strong word, but like things that would be sort of like a red flag if you say oh, this. Oh, I would use it. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going go to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to be a bit more combative. Um, you know, I, a lot of times I give these talks at conferences and I call it my my burning down my own house manifesto because, you know, this is the the field I've chosen to work in, but there there is a lot of bad research out there. And so when it comes to the client side being cautious, I think first thing you have to realize is that there's no vetting, right? So you don't have to have a special license or a special amount of education, no special degrees to be able to buy any of the equipment. It's, it's all off the shelf. If you have $3 million, you can buy an fMRI machine, right? You can go on Amazon right now and type in neuro, you can type in EEG and you can get some form of headset. How you know, accurate it is, is, you know, depends on how much you want to spend. But for the most part, you, if you have Amazon Prime, you get it here today, right? And then you can hang up a shingle outside your house and say you're a neuromarketer. So recognizing that that's a possibility uh, as an end client, you have to be cautious, right? And that might involve asking questions. So I think recognizing that if someone keeps just using fancy words on you and not telling you how something works, right? So instead of saying, oh, we're using this tool because it's measuring X, Y, and Z. Instead, they might say, well, we have a proprietary algorithm, which is in a black box that we can't tell you about because it's proprietary. Well, then they're probably hiding something, right? So either that that algorithm isn't real or isn't validated. Maybe even ask them for some validated studies where they've been peer reviewed, right? You know, case studies, even if they don't have published studies. Um, that kind of show what results really look like. Ask them if they do statistics. Surprising number of neuromarketers use no statistics. Uh, and that's really disturbing because if people are going to be making, you know, actionable results out of something, making a business decision based on these neuro results that don't even show a significant difference between two products, you know, that's, that's pretty troubling. Uh, but it happens a lot. And so, you know, asking those sort of questions, even, you know, just kind of playing dumb and saying, you know, explain it to me. How does it work? And if they can't explain it to you, then you should probably be concerned. And it's something, you know, I've been talking about this whole time is that 
each tool has a different purpose, right? And it's never the tool's fault. I want to say that really up front. It's, it's never the tool's fault. The tool does what it's supposed to do. It's the humans involved that make it a biased measure, right? Um, so some people try to say that neuroscience is unbiased. Well, it is biased because humans are involved in the interpretation. And so recognizing that the tools are used for different purposes means that you have to use it in the right occasion. So if someone comes to you and says, I sell this widget, they're only going to sell you a widget, right? They're not going to sell you a non-widget. So if you give them this research project, they say, oh, a widget can do that. Well, of course it does because they're not going to sell something else, right? Uh, so recognizing that if they aren't capable of saying that a different tool might be better or that other tools could be used um, or if they only use that one tool, you know, I think those are all red flags. So, you know, in being a consumer of any of this type of, of research, uh, I think you just have to be a little cautious because there definitely are people out there that are, are trying to sell things that these tools can't really do. And also, I think a big one is if they say that it's replacing asking, it's never true. None of the tools that exist out there can replace asking someone. Instead, it should be used to, you know, have some sort of synergistic effect on the data, right? So you're, you're getting more than just asking them. You're getting further understanding, deeper understanding of the consumer experience, not saying that, you know, you don't trust the consumer to answer. Yeah, those are really good uh, insights. And really a lot of those apply to many fields. And like one thing as you were talking about, I came back to is what we were talking about earlier and that how, you know, neuroscience, behavioral science, all these things are not like a magic bullet that can just explain everything. And I think like that's part of it too, is that, you know, for one, whenever we're evaluating really technical scientific tools of any kind, you know, we need to have some humility that it's not going to solve all of our problems. It's going right. to give us some interesting insights that might help us get towards a different, you know, give us new hypotheses to test or give us, um, you know, new insights we didn't have before. But, you know, it's not a magical solution to everything. And you should generally be weary when people try to sell it as such. Um, yeah, totally. I mean, I know I notice a lot in people that talk about behavioral science concepts that a big red flag for me is when people are not um, when people are much too confident about like this one heuristic or this one bias or this one intervention that can solve this problem um, and not, you know, noting that, you know, there are weaknesses to every study and that not everything's applicable 100% of the time, all these kind of things. So I guess it's probably kind of similar thing to neuroscience too. And if someone is, there's probably easy ways to tell when someone's overselling what they could possibly deliver. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that you know, a lot of the, the market out there is ripe for it because they're excited to use this cool tool, right? They like the look of the fancy pictures and they like the look of, um, you know, the using even the names, right? So being able, as a company, being able to say, oh, we've proven this neuroscientifically sounds really impressive. But, you know, you have to, again, just be cautious. Not everything that's shiny works, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, one of the, the stories that I really liked from when we were chatting earlier, Michelle, is and I don't, I don't know if you're able to share it here or not, but some of the early work that you had done on basically like, this was, a, I believe, a consumer good that it was, it was like an antacid or something like this. And so it was sort of like your goal was to lower people's like stress, essentially. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just like a really kind of interesting sort of microcosm of how this can, can work. And yeah. I wonder if that's, is that a short a story that you can share? Yeah, um, you know, I can share a version of it, right? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so it's definitely from a previous life. But when thinking about how any active works in a product or, you know, in a medication, OTC, over-the-counter kind of medication, um, let's say it's something that is like an antacid or some sort of, you know, stomach issue that you might have. When you're having a stomach issue, your anxiety level is high, right? And the whole act of taking a medication is to, you know, solve the problem, but that problem, you know, it, it's causing a lot of anxiety in you. And there's the idea that if you can bring this person's anxiety level down, that actually makes it easier for the active to work. Right. So it's kind of like taking advantage of the placebo effect a little bit. So kind of getting again, back to like, you know, psychological processes and the emotions of the actual consumer that's using the product thinking, can we make the person more comfortable and will that actually make them feel better so that it's easier for an active to work and they just feel better in general, right? In what is normally a very stressful situation. So if you can use something like a fragrance or a flavor that actually makes them feel better, you know, makes them feel more comfortable or brings their anxiety levels down, makes them feel more relaxed, 
then it's gonna be easier for the active to work. Because if you think about where their baseline is when they feel bad, well, that's you know kind of anxiety up high and, and bad situation up high. But if you can bring that down a little bit, it just makes the active that much easier to bring you down even further. So it's kind of having an ingredient that is having beneficial effects of beyond just its typical use. So not just being a pleasant flavor, a pleasant fragrance that people like, but actually having a part in, in having almost like a psychoactive effect, not a you know, truly psychoactive effect, but making you, you feel better, which ultimately is what the overall product needs to do. So it's kind of this whole you know, brand harmonization idea where each of the components needs to really add towards you know, some ultimate goal. So kind of like if you look at a bottle even and the imagery that's on the bottle, and if it's something that's supposed to be making you feel better when you're in a stressful situation, well then the imagery should probably be soothing too. Right, it shouldn't be something that is raising your anxiety levels, and so you know all those pieces sort of feed in to the ultimate experience that the consumer has. So there's a lot of different components that you can measure, but the, the ultimate thinking there is really about um, sort of a, a behavioral economic approach to design, right? Yeah, I really like that because it was. I think it helped me, like when we were first chatting about this, I think it helped me kind of understand how this research all kind of fits together and and even like draw some parallels between a lot of behavioral research too, where like you really wouldn't, uh, you know, you, you needed to have sort of a holistic understanding of both the, the product and the goal and the environment, the context in which this person is going to be using this product before you could really design and test your interventions, whether that's the design of the bottle or the fragrance or the um, the flavor or, or anything like that. So I thought yeah. that, that was just like a really kind of cool, it, it, it just sort of helped me kind of uh, understand sort of how this all sort of fits together and where there is sort of this uh, room for, like where this sort of specialized skill set comes in into the process. Yeah, absolutely. I think even something a little more less intense than, you know, a stomach situation, right, is if you think about shampoo. So I always like to use fruit teas as the example because it's really obvious, right? So a lot of, like when you go to the store and you're in the shampoo aisle um, and you're choosing a shampoo, most people crack open the lid and sniff it, right? So you see the bottle, you see the imagery on it, you see the name and you smell it and you decide whether or not it suits your, you, right? Who you wanna be, what you wanna smell like. And so when you think about a bottle of fructis, it's name has the word fruit in it. It's a green bottle with pictures of fruit on it. If you cracked open the lid and it smelled like vanilla simply because people like the smell of vanilla, this would not be a pleasant experience because it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not um, holistic you know, like you were saying. So you want the whole thing to add up to an ultimate goal. So if you, your name is Fruit Teas and the bottle's green, it's got fruit on it, it should smell fruity, right? Mm -hmm, but right. it all has to kind of like fit, you know? Yeah. Well, this is maybe also a good time to say that uh, my beard conditioner of choice is called Cowboy Magic. <laughs> So it's not uh, like cowboys. <laughs> and it's used uh, it's used primarily for show ponies, uh, for <laughs> detangling and adding some shine to their to their mane. So we haven't right. actually had a uh, uh, a sponsor of uh, Action Design Radio yet, but I think uh, oh, Cowboy Magic could be a good. Uh, <laughs> I think we're going to need a study on this to confirm the uh, confirm yeah. the effect of the cowboyness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Nice. Um, <laughs> that's now I'm curious what to, it smells like. <laughs> I, I am very curious. I might have to buy some just to satisfy that curiosity. Uh, uh, maybe if they sponsor us, I'll send us some free samples. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and, and like building on that, I think like I agree that was like an awesome example to see it all. Yes, together. build on that. <laughs> <laughs> building on the cowboy. <laughs> the previous part, I guess. Um, but but uh, you know, thinking about uh, you know how things come together, I think you, you you talked a little bit earlier about how sort of behavioral science fits into neuroscience a little bit, and mm -hmm. I think your example started bringing it together. And a question I had was like, as behavioral scientists, how should we think about neuro? Like, what do we need to know about neuroscience, and how should we think about ing integrating it at some point to combine more? So, like, you know, maybe that's a good segue from those examples to think of like how those examples apply to if we're working in behavioral work. You know, what are the things we should know about neuroscience, and maybe what are some recommendations for us to learn more about it um, mm -hmm. that will make us better? what we do and what, you know, what are the right times for us to work with neuroscientists to enhance what we do? 
Yeah, I think often, you know, when we're talking to a client that's interested in neuroscience or even talking to a potential collaborator that's interested, we start with, okay, what are your basic research questions that you ask? And are there any parts of it that you aren't able to answer? Right. So, okay, you ask people if they like something, you ask them what they do with it. Are there pieces that you can't seem to access or can't seem to understand? So what are, where are those knowledge gaps? And then we can try to see, okay, is there a way to fill those knowledge gaps with any of the methodologies? So, you know, if we're looking at EEG, well, is there something to see um, about, you know, someone's cognitive load? You know, so like when they're doing one task versus another, are they experiencing more cognitive effort going into thinking about it? That could tell you a lot about their decision making, right? And things that may maybe aren't quite so neuroscience-y, but using other physiological measures or behavioral measures like eye tracking, right? So being able to incorporate the eye tracking, which is really a behavioral measure, into also looking at say heart rate and heart rate variability could give you okay if say they're looking at an advertisement are they looking and how long are they looking at say when the logo comes up and what is their physiological response to it you know so you know what is that doing to their heart rate which could give you an indication of okay are they taking in new information is this new cognitive effort coming in um, are they paying attention to it so where the eye tracking is a behavioral measure that's telling you are they looking at it at all um, looking at some of the neuroscience measures the physiological measures could give you okay they're taking in the information um, they're paying attention to it. I don't know how often this happens to you that you just stare off into space, but if you were doing eye tracking on me when I'm just sort of staring at something, um, that doesn't mean I'm paying attention to it, right? So I can be burning a hole into something without even thinking about it, but if you do some of these additional measures, you might be able to better understand if the person's really paying attention, are they feeling more positive and negative? And to that sense, you know, it can be an unobtrusive way to do a measure as well. So if you're looking at something like heart rate or EEG, you're not interrupting the process to ask them a question about what they're experiencing because the second you interrupt, well, you change the experience, right? Uh, or even if you have them do a read aloud of their situation, which they do a lot in gaming, right? Gaming could be a good example of that where often they will have the gamer run through a game and um, be just sort of speaking aloud of their experience or where they're having frustrations, but that inherently alters the experience. So if you were to use something like EEG with eye tracking while they're playing the game, you might be able to look at something like cognitive flow, right? Which is a really exciting idea to see like how sort of in the moment they are with the game. Like, is it challenging enough? Is it too easy? Are they getting into flow? Which is pretty exciting when you think about things like that. So I hadn't really thought about this until just a moment ago as you were, you were answering this question, but the way that I sort of thought about this conversation and kind of even set it up was like, oh, there's sort of, there's neuroscience and there's behavioral science and there's some overlap and, you know, they complement each other here or there and there's maybe some differences. When you're thinking about those two disciplines, if you if it was like a Venn diagram, do you see that there's like overlap between one or the other? Or do you see that it's like neuroscience and then within the bubble of neuroscience, there would be all of behavioral science and then just yeah. some other things as well? <laughs> I think when you're designing studies, it's it's total overlap, right? Because, it, I mean, now, right? I think if you'd asked me when I was in academia, I would have said neuroscience, neuroscience, right? And maybe if I was studying humans, I might want to consider some behavioral science as well. But I think when it comes to looking at consumers and uh, product experiences or media experiences, communications experiences, you, it has to be a total overlap. You have to really think about behaviors and have that almost shape the neuroscience part. I feel like the neuroscience part is the tool, right? Um, thinking about things more behaviorally is really how you theoretically put it together. Measuring brain activity doesn't really tell you anything unless you put it in context. And I feel like the behavioral science gives you that context, if that makes sense. Totally, yeah, no, that's a very helpful answer. You know, really, the one of the kind of genesis of this conversation was an, an article that you had written that I read that I really liked. Um, that was kind of laying out a lot of sort of common myths about neuroscience, and here's kind of where it's useful. and And I found it like incredibly helpful. You know, we're we're kind of coming up on the end of our time here, and so uh, I'm wondering if there's um, what the best ways are for folks to kind of follow you and your work, and if there are other you know, places for them to find articles that you've read or things that you might recommend they take a look if they are interested in learning more about neuroscience. 
Sure. Um, you know, visiting the, the company's website that I work for, HCD Research, um, you can look at hcdi.net. You can Google me, right, if you can figure out how to spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the title of the podcast. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So look at the title, Google me, you'll probably find <laughs> some of the articles come up or looked on, look on LinkedIn. Uh, or just ask me, really, you know, um, we have a Twitter account that we tweet a lot of neuroscience research from, it's HCD Neuroscience, you know, so you can go there and check it out. Uh, and I, I do tend to write a lot, so you'll, you'll find a lot of random pieces of me talking about these very issues, uh, you know, the pressures that you can get as a research provider where people, you know, want cheaper, better, faster, um, and, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on people to, you know, make claims that aren't, aren't real or, you know, talk beyond what the, the methods can do. So, um, yeah, ask the questions, you know, check it out. Ask me. Uh, I'm always open. I love talking about this stuff. I could talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Let's see, Eric, do you have any kind of final questions? Or I don't think so. Um, that covered a lot of the stuff we had in the notes. And I think, yeah, like really good examples. And it was really helpful, especially for me as someone who was a, you know, very preliminary understanding of neuroscience has really kind of helped me uh, understand not only the field more, but really how it interacts with behavioral science, which has always been sort of a question in the back of my mind. So we really appreciate you joining and uh, providing so much insight for this. This was really good. It's great. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think behavioral science is the way it's all going more towards, you know, where people were just saying EEG, neuroscience. Um, then it became more thinking about things in system one context. And now people are really starting to think about it more with as a piece of, uh, behavioral science, which I think is, is the best approach, really, when you think about incorporating research together, piecing it all together to figure out humans, right? Yeah. That's what we're all trying to do. Behavioral science is one big happy family of all these exciting, <laughs> exciting fields of various yeah. degrees, yeah. <laughs> all right, Michelle, well, awesome. thanks again very much for joining us. This was great, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other platforms where you might typically get your pod on. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness about behavioral economics, psychology, and all things behavioral science in order to help you improve your life, your career, and your understanding of the world around us and the people in it. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once again, that's action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States and Canada. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.